Hello and welcome back to the Littlest Petcast. I am your host James and today we are jumping into Season 2 with the episode Missing Blythe. I cannot wait to get back into this. Okay, so uh, it begins with a previously on section where it just describes uh, what happens, sort of. It doesn't go past the halfway point in terms of clips they use, but, I mean, get the general idea of Blythe's not going to be there for the summer. And that's why we're missing Blythe. (laughs) Anyway, so uh, then it jumps into the intro, and then it jumps into Blythe talking about Fashion University North. So there's like a giant scissors there as well, and a giant needle with a button. Like, those are like installations they have on campus to mark dorms or whatever. Speaking of dorms, the dorm Blythe is staying at is the so what dorm. So yeah, this is probably not a historical university. Now that I think about it. <laughs> Cuz like what like why 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 would a historical university have pun names for their buildings? Like usually at universities it's like I don't know historical people who built or helped build the university or people who paid money not puns and this this was like like a fashion university set up by oh, what's his name the the eighth and a half president from gravity falls i bet he would set up a campus with uh you know pun names because why not <laughs> Because it's fun like that. So it's either history that they want us to forget. Or this is just a new university that's trendy and hip with the kids. You know. You know, like I'm not one of them kids. So... And then pan into Blythe's room, and we see Blythe's roommate, uh, named McKenna Nicole. Okay, I had to stop because I'm A, tired, and B, my nose is a bit stuffy, and I didn't want to deal with that for the rest of the show. But in that time, I also... Uh, learned the name of the character I was trying to think of. Quentin Tremblay. So, there you go. Maybe this was founded by Quentin Tremblay. I mean... Maybe. Anyway, McKenna Nicole, Blythe's roommate, who is just as, maybe more fashion-loving than Blythe, and, uh... Blythe explains that there's, like, a bunch of uh, fashion stuff littered around the room to the point where, like, the bottom bunk is, like, draped with, like, clothes as, like, a means of privacy for Blythe, who has the bottom bunk. Which, I don't know. Does it seem like she would take the bottom bunk? Or would you rather have the top bunk but didn't get there first? These are the real questions of the littlest pet shop. So, yeah, either way, she's on the bottom bunk. You know what? I think she might be satisfied with the bottom bunk because she can have that layer of privacy. And, you know, she's kind of a private person, as we've kind of established. I don't think I've established that aspect of her in full yet, but I think it kind of goes without saying. But I'm going to say it anyway. So, like, 
really, she's like in a new area. She doesn't know anyone. And she is maybe a little scared of her new surroundings. But, I mean, she's having fun at fun. But, like, she also doesn't want to let anyone fully in quite yet. I don't know. Like, it was probably easier for her to do at uh, Downtown City. Because she had Roger there. But she has no one here. So, maybe... So, okay, back at the episode of, of speaking of Roger, uh, I love this scene because <laughs> it has Roger in it. So Blythe is chatting with Roger on the laptop using like a webcam thing with the laptop. And uh, Blythe says she's fine, but asks Roger how he's really doing. And Roger says he's also doing fine, but then the toaster immediately catches fire. Blythe asks if everything's okay, but Roger still insists everything is fine. The smoke detector goes off, and Roger says we just need to change smoke detector batteries because everything's fine. <laughs> Gotta go, and he hangs up. And then uh, he gets a fire extinguisher and says, I'm not going to lose another toaster to a flame. And then uses it, but like blows it all and just knocks himself over with it while also flooding the kitchen with a uh, fire extinguisher juice. Man, I don't even know what that stuff's called. Is it just foam? Is it just foam, like like a soap foam, but harder? Oh, whatever. So then, in the pet shop, uh, the pets are reminiscing about Blythe and their adventure uh, where they charged into the largest ever pet shop to steal a pet, basically. <laughs> So they're talking about Gale Break. And they must have it really bad if they're fondly remembering Gale Break. Because, like, that wasn't really that good for them or me. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to go full in on, like, how much I didn't really like Gale Break. It was boring, and it didn't work out for them, and they basically stole a pet. I basically, just whatever. So, they have trouble remembering what actually happened, but they still conclude that it was better because Blythe was there. And the pets all miss Blythe, but Vinny's like, Hey, we have Madison, right? But then Madison opens the door, and she's wearing like a gas mask and rubber gloves and she slides over their food so as not to get close to them and like she's okay with this but the rest of the pets aren't and then they remember that it's almost time for Blythe's webcam check-in and Penny Ling says it's nice that uh, Mrs. Tomley installed the webcam so that Blythe can see us but then Russell points out that they can't see her, which which is a little strange. Like, you know what? Maybe it's not entirely strange, because I don't know where Mrs. Tomley knows how much uh, has happened. Like, I don't know if Mrs. Tomley knows that pets know how computers work. I don't know. Like, a basic understanding. Like, she lets them watch television, but she doesn't, like, put, like, a screen up so that they can see Blythe and they can see that she's doing okay. Like, like, what? 
Is this Mrs. Twombly? The pets are equally as concerned. And they would like to see Blythe as well. Like, come on! <laughs> uh, like, I don't... I don't get it. Like, how much does she know and not know? That comes up later, by the way, but not in this context. In a different context. A very different context that uh, maybe I don't... I don't have an ending to that sentence. So, it's weird. It's super weird. So then back at fun, McKenna is asking Blythe which hat looks better between a floppy hat and a fedora. And Blythe says she looks good in both. And McKenna says that that's the problem. And then she goes with the fedora. Um. Uh. No, I don't really know how to make a joke about this right now because I'm super tired. McKenna then says, uh, it's almost time for class. And Blythe says, uh, she'll catch up. She just wants to check something. She then turns on the webcam and sees the pets having fun. But it does look odd. But maybe that's because I know what's going on, but Blythe doesn't. You know, um, dramatic irony. I guess, to use the proper term. Anyway, uh, McKenna comes back and asks her if she's talking to the pets again. Blythe is embarrassed by this, playing into, like, the whole trying to be sort of secretive but kind of open at the same time uh, thing. And McKenna points out that they can't talk back, which is true because they don't have the actual means to converse. <laughs> Come on, Mrs. Twombly! Come on! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, but... I don't care right now. I'm tired, and I just want to... I don't... Why did I do this? Like, I know, I know it takes longer, but, like... I don't know why I put it off until late at night again. Uh, let's just, let's just get through this. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I'm doing this tired, but I just gotta, I just gotta go. This, this will be the last time I mention it. Probably. I will try. I will certainly try, but I can't make a promise like that wholeheartedly. So, let's keep it going. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. So, McKenna drags Blythe out to class, and Blythe closes the door. Is, like... I mean, is it behind her in this instance, or is it because she's being dragged by her back and she's closing it? Is it the door in front of her and she's dra being dragged from behind? I think... That one makes sense. So she closes the door in front of her while she's being dragged from behind. Okay. Language structure set. So with that out of the way, um, at the pet shop, the light turns off. And Russell says that uh, Blythe is no longer accessing the webcam. That's a little harder to say when you're trying to be at least PG. So anyway, uh, lights off. Russell says she's not. I'm in that trap again. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. The pets stop and they wonder how long they can keep pretending to have fun. But inside, they feel really sad that Blythe is uh, not there. So, um, Penny Ling then suggests that they should avoid the webcam entirely. 
And then Russell says that that's a bit suspicious. Because, like, if we all avoid the webcam, Blythe will know something's up. So some of us have to be in it. Also, in this point of uh, my notes, I pointed out that I need to get back into gear. This is because I was, like, misspelling stuff like crazy. And I know, like, I type a little too fast sometimes, so I misspell something sometimes. But it felt weird. I guess it's because I haven't done it since, like, late March. So... I guess I'm a bit out of practice. And I'm a bit out of practice with this. So I really need to kick myself into high gear. Anyway. uh, Then a car horn honks. And the pets investigate. And Mrs. Twombly uh, is seen uh, finishing washing a car. And it has LPS on it. And Minka deduces that it's the littlest pet shuttle. So back at fun, Blythe walks out of the dorm building, and then a song happens. Because that's how songs do in this show. They don't start, they just happen. And this happens. And it feels like a Disney musical song, like a like like high school musically about fun well fashion university north we already had a song about fun and that was a ska song this is this why is this hard now why is it hard talking about this again this is part of the fun of this show. <laughs> okay. Okay, so then, um, you know, the song, it's fine, I guess. I don't know. Like a Disney high school musical y song. That's alright. I guess, I don't know. It's. Um, it's fine. But, like, I do want to talk a little bit about the rest of the students. Now, I'm not the brightest when it comes to fashion. But, like, since a lot of the students are dressed fashionably, I can't really tell, like, what constitutes as, like, like a joke. Or is it too little or too much? Or is it just actual fashion? It's hard to tell because they're so mishmashed. And we'll get to that a little later because, like, I did not take the time to write down everyone's costumes, but there is, like, three later on. Well, I mean, in here too but they're they're a little more prominent later that I will talk about so uh the song itself narratively like starts with Blythe really liking fun but then like it goes a little sour when the other students crowd in on her and all they want to do is talk about fashion And she wants to take a break. But like I said, everyone's crowding around her, even in her room. And she's just trying to escape a little. And then she comes to the conclusion that uh, fashion can sometimes be boring. And that's where the song ends. And we are in a class where we are learning about a new dye from the beginning of the 1900s called Idanthrines. Idanthrines? I kind of forgot how it was pronounced. Honestly. Because, like, I had the rest of the notes to take and, you know, this to record. So, Idanthrins. 
I-N-D-A-N-T-H-R-E-N-E-S. Idanthrins. So the reason it's a little dry is because the teacher is kind of boring. And in terms of design and mannerisms, it's a decent Ben Stein, but no effort went into an impression. He's performing like he's Ben Stein, but he's not doing the actual Ben Stein voice. He's just doing the mannerisms and uh, stuff, not the actual pitch of the voice. So, oh yeah, another thing that came up was, uh, like, the idea of subtitles. Like, I usually watch this show and most of my shows with subtitles off because, you know, it's, um, I can generally understand what's going on. And usually, if I don't understand what's going on, it's not important. But, like, I do turn it on sometimes to catch words, like, idanthrins. And to catch the name of the punny dorm. So, like, I was thinking I should just keep subtitles on all of the time. But then, like, it has the problem where, like, Sometimes the subtitle pops up before they start speaking, like, by half a second, which is still, like, a bit too early for me. But, like, at the same time, like, I turned on sometimes anyways for things like I dance. So, that's just something for me to ponder. Unless you want to provide input. So, should I watch it with subtitles? If you tell me, I'll probably do it. So then, um, uh, back at the pet shop, we're getting back into the episode now. Madison asks what the shuttle is for, and Mrs. Tomley explains that it's so she can pick up, drop off, and deliver food to customers and pets. So Russell asks if they heard that, and Minnie says sort of because he has water in his ears. For some reason. It's not really clear. He says he put his ear in drinking water. Or drinking water in his ear. But is it just because he was bored. And just so down that he just did that without thinking? Maybe. So then Russell tells them. That. Um, the shuttle can go wherever. And then. Uh, he says including fun, which is where Blythe is. So all they have to do is uh, fake a form to get them to go to fun so that they can visit Blythe. And he lays that uh, crumb trail out so that the rest of the pets can pick up on what he's dropping down. Except for Vinny, who still has water in his ear. So, um, Blythe is checking the, um, the pet shop again, but they're avoiding the camera and they're doing a reverse pyramid next to the camera. And Russell says that, uh, they all can't avoid the camera. And Zoe asks Penny Ling to go in front of the camera and Penny Ling asks why. But before an answer can get out to that question, Vinny thanks Sunil for knocking the water out of his ear by standing on him, but now it itches, so he's scratching it, which wobbles the reverse pyramid. Blythe notes that they aren't there and closes her laptop. So the pets fall over, and Russell says that they need to hurry up with their plan because they can't keep doing this. They can't pretend to be happy. They actually have to be happy or just be miserable. Also, I do quick want to point out like how 
lazy an explanation they have for why the tower needs to fall down eventually. Because, like, Vinny has water stuck in his ears from something. But how did he get that? I don't know. He was just depressed and put his head in water? Maybe? Is that how he handles sadness? Because that's not a good way to deal with that. So either way... Uh... Right, this scene. We're back at Fawn, and Blythe is sitting with McKenna and a few other students. And McKenna is talking about hats, and Blythe is bored, but everyone else is interested. And, uh, I, this is the scene where I wanted to talk about, like, a few specifics. But just so you can get, like, like how wide a range this is in terms of Fashion in air quotes. Uh, so, like I said, it's kind of a mishmash. So, the three other students there, uh, one of them is wearing like a blue, long, furry coat with like dark blue polka dots on it. And he is like, just like a businessy kind of attire underneath and then uh one of them is wearing like a black hoodie with like a bunch of pink splotches and cat ears and then one of them is just straight up wearing a kimono and like a purple wig it is super mishmashy and it's like mishmashy in a way where it's more Picasso and not like exhibity, you know, like because, like, the, the pets, Blythe designs clothes for them from time to time, and like their outfits are different, but they still seem a little cohesive in a way. Where it's like, this is what this pet would look like in this and together they're all kind of different and unique but you know it still feels the same i guess it's because it's by the same designer but like the students here have like wildly different fashions and like i don't know it's just weird to look at it's not bad by any means but like it's just weird to look at. So then Blythe suggests that they take a break, but everyone gasps in horror as why would we take a break? Fashion is life. Fashion is everything. No gods, no kings, only fashion. But then uh, McKenna saves Blythe by saying that she's just joking and laughs it off. The other students laugh as well, but Blythe was being serious and then she gets a text and takes it and it's from her friends who had just written the roller coaster on zany island she then gets uh really sad about that because she's like missing them and just is generally homesick and like being here isn't exactly helping her I mean, it helps her become a better fashion person, but not a better person in general. Like, yeah, I did I did kind of mention that this might happen uh, last time in uh, Summertime Blues. But, like, I mean, I, I knew this was coming, but it's still, it's still interesting to think about. So then... Um, Russell, Pepper, and Sunil are in Blythe's room executing the first part of their plan. And Russell types up the necessary information and Pepper and Sunil want him to add details about a funny skunk and a handsome mongoose. Russell says that there's no actual pet that they're going to pick up so it shouldn't matter, but it does matter to them so Russell goes for it. 
and then he sends it and Sunil says that that's impressive and Russell thinks it's because that they came up with a foolproof plan which I would give it a pass for being a better plan because one of your previous plans was make a truck go out of control again, but this time film it. So this is at least better than that. Although that is a low bar because that is the worst idea. But then Sunil says uh, that you can type so well with those tiny little fingers. And Russell looks mad at him. But I do want to bring that up as well. Uh, because Russell was typing and he clearly hits the same key twice, but he gets a different letter each time. I mean, what is this? Some kind of magic keyboard? (laughs) I, I couldn't resist. Like, it just, (laughs) it just, it just came up. So anyway, in a class at fun, the teacher is having the students design something practical but fashionable, and Blythe is working on a backpack that can hold pets, and the teacher is impressed with this and tells Blythe that she will be good at fashioning. I was flying on the seat of my pants right there, but fashioning is a word... And I did not put it in that context. So maybe that's where it comes from. Yay! English is weird! (laughs) Anyway. uh, Backing up, though. This was mentioned in Trading Places. On the way to school, Roger and Blythe were discussing this in... The car. That's what I was uh, alluding to during that scene. Like, was this actually planned? Was this, like, planned? Like, like, were they planning on introducing this in season two and just bringing it up in season one? Because if it was, that's pretty good. But if, like, oh, we have a season two, might as well bring that back or completely on accident, that's pretty cool, too. It's really interesting. Maybe, maybe I really like this detail. Like, it really shows that the writers have a good attention to detail, even if they have magic keyboards. <laughs> <sighs> okay. But yeah, I like that detail. McKenna then compliments Blythe and asks for help on her hat. Blythe says sure, but wants to make a phone call first. So Blythe calls LPS and gets Madison. Madison doesn't know who it is at first, and then when Blythe explains who she is, Madison thinks that Blythe is sick. And that the shop is icky. And Blythe is annoyed by this because neither of those facts are true. Madison says that Mrs. Twombly is busy and that the pets are probably fine. He doesn't really go back there much because it's icky and filled with scales and fur and stuff. So uh, then Russell's order pops up. And Madison says she needs to perform one of her many duties and hangs up. And Blythe is annoyed again. The pets are spying on Madison taking their order. And Madison reports to Mrs. Trombley and gives her the slip. Mrs. Trombley says that that's where Blythe is. And Madison wonders if uh, Fashion University North has good doctors. And everyone is confused. (laughs) Because Blythe is not sick. But Mrs. Tomley takes the bait hook, line, and sinker. So 
back at fashion camp, uh, Blythe is looking at photos of her friends and dad and just missing home in general. And then the PA system comes on and says that there's a day trip tomorrow for downtown city. Okay, I have to wonder, is that also not a historical thing? Because, like, it's just called downtown city. It's, like, like, there's no good context for it. Like, it's it can't be historical in any sense of the word. So uh my thinking now is that downtown city was originally a section of New York City that broke off to become its own city. Like, it's a series of neighborhoods or maybe just one of the boroughs. I don't know. That's also why it only has a quarter of the population at, like, 2 million when New York has, like, 8 million. So, yeah, that's uh, that's my new headcanon for this. Downtown City just broke off and then just called itself Downtown City because we're downtown we're new we're modern we're not new york because that has the rings of you know uh colonialism we're just downtown because that's what we are so anyway blythe is excited to go home and mrs Twombly is excited to go to fun <laughs> And, you know, that's where the foolproof part of the plan becomes fooled. Though it is still better than running off with an ice cream truck again. I meant sweet truck, but I'm going to roll with it and film it. And then uh, another detail I like about this scene is that at fun, Blythe says, no way. And then the announcer responds, way. Which I always find somewhat funny. Also, the announcer is a better Ben Stein than the teacher, but still not Ben Stein. So, the next day, Mrs. Trombley buckles the pets in. And then uh, Roger meets up as she's about to leave and asks if she's ready. And Mrs. Trombley says, as ready as a June bug in July. Then they both look confused, and Mrs. Trombley says, I don't know what that means either. So this is the problem I was talking about earlier. How does she not know what Junebug and July means? She knows a bunch of really old medical terms, like the fading of the lights, or whatever it was. I think it was that. I'd have to check, but, you know, I want to get this podcast to rolling. So how does she not know this? Is it just because it's a southern thing and she's lived in downtown city for, I'm going to say, most of her life at this point? It's really hard to quantify that for me because, like, I'm still in my 20s. Meanwhile, she's, like, in her 60s or 70s. So just... Settling down and opening a pet shop, I guess, would constitute most of her life. Okay. Like, but even if she was, like, up north for most of her life, she did go on a whirlwind tour throughout the world displaying her novelty martial art of kung fu quilting, which I'm assuming would include the South, Unless she was banned from uh, performing her martial art because she was supporting civil rights causes. And the South wasn't having that at that time. (laughs) You know what? I might consider that headcanon. You know? Because, like, 
why else would you not know uh June bug in July? But no like a fifteen hundreds medical term. Like it doesn't make sense. Roger says he has to work, but they uh still go and they part ways in um puns that they actually get. So then Blythe is on the bus and McKenna is staying behind. And McKenna is asking her about hats again. And uh, as the bus is leaving, McKenna points out that they have a mandatory course on the history of plaid when they get back. Which Blythe is not looking forward to. So uh, on the way, driving at 90, down old country lanes... We are not singing to Tiny Dancer because the pets are making noise and Mrs. Trombley interprets that as sing for us. And Pepper says, I wasn't saying that. Were you saying that? And then Russell says, no. So then Mrs. Trombley began singing 99 cans of pet food on the wall. So we're not singing Tiny Dancer. We're singing that annoying car thing. So then, on the bus, Blythe is asleep and dreams another musical sequence, which is, like, the same song but with a tonal shift, and it's, like, more sinister and just, like, overwhelming. And Blythe laments the lack of variety that Fashion University North provides. And then the rest of the students come up as, like, zombie-type things with, like, Coraline button eyes and then they're just circling around Blythe like fashion and then there's a plaid monster that shows up and that scares Blythe awake and she yells the plaid monster is gonna get me and the rest of the students look at her and she plays it off like she was listening to a song which I thought was weird at the time, but then now that I'm saying it, it does go into, like, I don't want to be too open here kind of vibes, you know? So then uh, Mrs. Trombley is at no more cans of pet food on the shelf, and the pets are relieved. Because they did not want to endure that. But then she starts up again by placing an order and then starting from 99. <laughs> so then Zoe barks at a rest stop area and Mrs. Twombly takes that as a sign that they want to stretch their legs. So they stop at the rest stop and so does the fun bus. The fun Fun bus, Fashion University North bus. Holy moly. Fun bus sounds like something completely different. Like, distinguishingly different. So, uh... But, like, there's a big hot dog truck that gets in the way so they don't see each other. And Blythe is, like, wearing headphones so that she doesn't really hear what's going on. And the pets aren't looking at the counter where Blythe is at. So they just end up missing each other and continue to go opposite ways. So, uh... And then a plane lands, and Roger is actually surprising Blythe, but Blythe is back home and walks into the pet shop. She runs into Madison, who again does not know who she is until she explains who she is. Madison says that Blythe probably feels better, and Blythe is still not great with that. And then Blythe says she came here to surprise everyone, but Madison informs her that the shuttle is out. And Blythe wonders how long it'll take. And then, um, 
Madison says that, uh, like, they went to Fashion University North to meet someone, and then she realizes it was to meet Blythe. So then the whole craziness just clicks in Madison's head, and then it clicks in Blythe's head. And then Blythe asks, are you serious? And then Madison says, not very often, but right now, yes. <laughs> oh, Madison is something else. And you'll see that in the next line I'm going to show off of hers. Blythe wants to go see her dad, but then Madison says that he's not here either. And that he was in his pilot's uniform, which means he was either working or at a costume party. <laughs> Man, Madison is just one of a kind. So then Mrs. Tromley pulls up to fun, goes to the front desk to get the pet she was sent for. And Mrs. Tromley reads the name, which is, of course, the tamest, like, gag name, Anita Bath. But the pets still giggle, and I'm assuming it'll get a giggle out of the kids who the target audience is for. But, you know, I've been watching The Simpsons for quite some time, as you can tell by that magic keyboard bit. <laughs> so, no. So, the guard, who looks like the same guard as the other guards we've seen in Lights, Camera, Mongoose, and What's in the Batter, which is weird, because... You'd think they'd have different guards, but I guess they didn't want to animate someone else. Either that, or it's like a uniform that you have to be this bulky and this bald to be a guard, and it's a thing. I mean, they're probably really good at guarding, because they have to strict regiment. But, no, the guard says that she's been pranked. Mrs. Tombley is mad about that, but then asks to see Blythe. But then Roger walks out, changed, I might add. He's in his, like, civilian clothes. He changes fast. And, uh, he informs that, uh, Blythe is not here because she actually took a bus to come visit us. And, uh, Mrs. Trombley is again shocked and appalled by this fact. But then Blythe is outside to sweet delights and calls Young Me. She tells her to look out the window, and Young Me comes to the window and sees Blythe. Uh, Blythe tells her what happened, and then Young Me has an idea. Trombley thanks Roger for riding back with her. And Roger asks if the pets want to hear a story of Blythe when she was young. The pets cheer, but Mrs. Tomley say they love my singing, and the pets' face turn super sour. But then she concludes that if they want to hear a story, that's Jake too. Okay, Jake is like a 1910s slang for, like, cool. It's an over a hundred year slang at this point. How does Mrs. Tombley know Jake, but not Junebug in July? It has to be that she and the South have a mutual disrespect because she stands for civil rights and the South at the time she was going from place to place did not. And that's the only conclusion I can concur. Because I think, like, she did take on racially diverse opponents. I don't remember all of them exactly. I, I know there was, like, an Asian person at the end that was the last person she fought before she tore her Achilles tendon. But 
I don't remember if she fought a black person, to be perfectly honest. Maybe I'm getting that sense, but I don't really remember. So then Roger starts telling his story about when Blythe was three. And then Blythe, young me, got Aunt Christy to drive them down. And they're singing 99 layers of cake. So, whatever. I guess Aunt Christie's used to that kind of torture because she provides it daily. All hail. <laughs> anyway. So then Roger is telling the story slowly. And like a lot of time has passed. But we're only on Blythe's fourth birthday. And Mrs. Tromley points out the rest stop again. And asks to stretch her ears. But then corrects herself to legs. So young me points out the rest stop too and asks to use the bathroom. So uh, the Lil's pet shuttle and the Sweet Delights truck meet and Blythe and Roger get out and hug out. Then the pets come out to pile onto Blythe. So they set up a picnic time thing and Christy is just selling stuff from her truck like the businesswoman she is. I am calling you out, construction worker from that episode that was making fun of her. Stop. She's a businesswoman. So, uh, Roger says that they should just accompany her back. But Blythe says she wants to come home and doesn't want to spend the rest of the summer at a uh, fashion university north. She's frustrated, but also kind of bored and just also homesick. And she wants to do other things. Roger says that that's okay, and uh, she tells the pets, and they're ecstatic. And Roger and Mrs. Tomley have a brief conversation about how the animals understand Blythe, and thus ends the episode. So, getting back into season two from season one, it's a pretty easy get back into the show episode. It's not too wild and out there, but it's also not too toothless either. It it goes for what it wants to, and it really sticks the landing, I think. It's a very sweet episode and also a pretty funny one. I mean, I guess it's kind of bog standard, but... I don't know. It's enjoyable nonetheless. So, that should be it for this episode of the Littlest Pet Cast. Be sure to leave a rating and review on Shout Engine, on Apple Podcasts, on the Google Play Store, and wherever else RSS feeds go when they're a little rusty because they haven't done this in about three weeks. And tune in next time for the episode, The Nest Hat Craze. I will see you then. Baxter, 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 anyone? I made an attempt. It's not a good Ben Stein, but at least I tried.